Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is March 10th, 2014, and my guest is John Cochran, the AQR Capital Management Distinguished Service Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. He's also a senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. John, welcome back to Econ Talk. It's a pleasure to be here. John, you recently taught your first MOOC, and that stands for Massive Open Online Course. And we're going to talk about that experience, what you learned, and what you think of the potential for MOOCs to disrupt traditional uh, education. So let's start with the course itself. What was the subject matter? And give us a rough idea of what it covered. Uh, So I decided for my first MOOC uh, to do a um, PhD level asset pricing class. Uh, So it's the first PhD course in asset pricing. And it covers the standard theory of how we think about stocks, bonds, and how they relate to the macroeconomy. Uh, I did that course first because uh, it's very um, straightforward material, not a lot of interpretation. It's kind of math that you learn and learn to interpret. And I thought that would port well to MOOCs in in my first effort. And then I could go on and and do more discussion, interpretive stuff once I learned the technology. And what was the – do you have the formal name of the class? Does it have a formal asset name? Asset pricing. That's that's the name. Asset pricing. Yes. Go go to Coursera, and uh, look up asset pricing, and you'll be able to look at it now. I, I leave it open for people who are interested. So anybody can go there now and take it for free, or do you have to pay uh, yes. something? You can go now and and go through it. Um, MOOCs are organized into sessions. We're actually taking it. You have to do it while it's offered, along with the other community of people who are taking it. And then a professor like me, you can leave it up there so people can go through it. And and most of it, I think, is still available now. You should point out, uh, in case those listening don't know what a PhD PhD level uh, finance class on asset pricing is about, it's it's a very mathematical class. It's very challenging. Um, It doesn't have, as you said, doesn't have a lot of casual intuition about, say, how to be an investor, correct? That's right. This is not how to make money in the stock market. This is uh, this is. I think it is useful for lots of people. This is the theory of of how we think markets come to equilibrium, and all sorts of apparently interesting ways of making money really are just ways of taking on risk. But the language is mathematical. Uh, it's not really so much doing math as staring at math and getting the intuition of math. And it's useful if you want to uh, learn how to read the academic literature on on asset pricing. Yeah. So how many people took the class? Uh, like like all of these, uh, a lot of people uh, were interested. I got 37,000 who signed up, but in the end, uh, 4,000 were watching the videos, uh, and about 300 took it all the way through and took the exam. Uh, this class took about 15 hours a week outside of class. There was I ported all my PhD level problem sets to Coursera, and so that was a lot of work. Um, and I one thing I learned is that there's a larger demand to watch the videos and take some quizzes than there is to do 15 hours a week of hard problem sets. <laughs> Surprise. Uh, But was it also offered at the same time as a regular class at the University of Chicago? Yes, I based this class on my PhD class. Another reason I did this class was because I had it all pretty well prepared, and I did them at the same time. Part of the thing I was experimenting with was the flipped classroom concept, where my on-campus class took the uh, Coursera online class first and then came to the class for uh, discussion and elaboration, not watching my butt while I put uh, equations on the board. And how many people were in that Chicago class, in in the real non-virtual class? Yeah, we had about 30 people uh, in the uh, the Chicago class. So of the 300 that completed the coursework and did the exams, uh, so some close to 30 presumably were your regular PhD students, and the other 270 were people from all over the country or all over the world. Do you have any idea where they're from? Yeah, um, a good geographic distribution, a lot from Europe, a uh, uh, bunch of Russians, uh, some Latin Americans, a uh, bunch of Americans. 
Uh, so people from all over. Uh, we didn't really get that many Chinese, but I think <laughs> that's because my main method of advertising the class was my blog, and my blog is blocked in China, so they didn't hear about it. Maybe, maybe next time. And, uh, and that's uh, one of the, one of the interesting things was I, I did get learning who was interested in this. Um, a bunch of Booth alums were interested in it. Uh, PhD students at other universities. Uh, a lot of people in the industry who were kind of you know, wanted to deepen their knowledge of where the models came from that they were using. Uh, so interesting spread of people, faculty at other institutions who uh, wanted to catch up on asset pricing. You know, they might have been experts in something else. And when you're talking about that survey, that distribution of folks and, and the differences between them, that would be true of the 4,000, not just the 300. Again, let's, let's 37,000 were interested 4,000 watched some or all the videos and 300 did all the work. Is that a good way to describe it? And uh, 4,000 got through all the videos and, and 300 uh, did all the work. There, there was about uh, usual – MOOCs usually have about a 10 percent per week uh, fall-off rate and, and mine did as well. There's, there's a quick fall-off as the shoppers leave and then um, you know about 5 to 10 percent per week after that. And, and that's one of the big issues of MOOCs is keeping people engaged and – and getting them to finish the, the initial fall off, I don't think is so bad because you know people shop, and that's the whole point. And yeah, I don't understand thing about MOOC because it's free to sign up. So you know the thirty-seven thousand look, take one. They look at my first lecture, which was a review of stochastic calculus, and they said, mm, "That's not for me," and so that's appropriate. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't understand this idea that um, that if people don't finish it, there's something wrong with the course. I, it's like saying. You should finish every book. When I was younger, I, I finished every book I started. It's a bad policy. I, I took me a long time to grow out of that. There's some value to it. But this idea that somehow if you try something, you don't like it, there's something wrong with what you tried. It seems like a strange idea. Well, I think there's two aspects to that. Uh, one is is you're exactly right. We, we, we shouldn't look at that initial drop-off. However, the big question is, you know, do MOOCs – uh, substitute for conventional education. And one of the functions that conventional education does is it's a, a social and pre-commitment mechanism. You know, you get in here and you, even though around week seven, you think, uh, you know, spring is coming, boy, I'd rather go outside than finish this class. Uh, it's on a schedule. You're going to, you know, you have the threat of the bad grade keeps you to keep going. So um, it, it is, a, you know, it, it would be nice if MOOCs could serve some of that function as well. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. So what was – talk about the technology of what you had to do uh, to actually get the course up online and um, how much time it took, what the experience was like. Give us a little bit of the flavor of that because I think most people think, oh, you just get in front of a camera and they film you and that's nice. But that's not what happened. <laughs> yeah, I thought so too, uh, which I soon – I quickly learned to regret. Um, MOOCs are like all technology. Um an innovation that gives you zero marginal cost and a very large fixed cost. Uh, so adding an extra student to the MOOC costs you nothing, whereas, of course, classrooms are a limited size and, and expanding is hard there. That's the good part of MOOCs. The downside of MOOCs is like all technology, the fixed cost is, is high. It is much more expensive in, in time and effort to get something up as a MOOC and to revise a MOOC uh, than it is to just put your notes together and go give a lecture. Um, part of that is learning the technology and, and then part of it is adapting the technology to what you do and just, you know, like, like designing a web page. It takes a lot of time to do it. Uh, so that was my first – it takes not just time and technological expertise. Uh, it takes a team. I had a, a great support team here at the University of Chicago who, who not just knew the technology but knew the pedagogy um, knew how to do it. I, I thought, oh, yeah, I'll just tape my class. No, 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 no. You have to prepare uh, short videos with in-video quizzes, get that all set ahead of time. And, and I was very grateful for the support I got. Um, so you, you, to put together a good MOOC, you really don't just turn on your, your laptop webcam and start talking. Uh, it really helps to have a team of people who know what they're doing, who understand the pedagogy of it, understand how to use the technology. The, 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 the technology is already getting to the point where just sitting – you don't just want to sit down with this and, and uh, put the MOOC on. You want help. So in thinking about I the – go on. What? Sorry, I, I can go on and on about the, my experience with the technology <laughs> and how it works, and I'll, I'll let you probe for how much yeah, of that. Well, first I want to I go on the other side of the, of the screen. I want to talk about the student experience. So as a, and I've looked at a little bit of the, of, the, um, of the class. 
my it, it's I was a little surprised. It is you filmed at the blackboard. That is, it's not the blackboard blown up to fill the screen with your voice as an as a voiceover. The filming was you writing down equations, talking about them, gesturing, pointing like a regular classroom. Uh, so I, if I'm watching this as a student, I'd see that the way I would see you in the classroom. What were the what's different? What, what are the qui- what role did the quizzes play? Talk about how they were set up. Uh, in other assignments, how are they graded? And office hours to the extent they were possible. Okay, so the student experience, at least in my MOOC, and, and there's there's an interesting question: How do we use this technology? Because there's lots of different ways to set up student experience. But the student experience in, in my MOOC was you would go to uh, you'd go to weekly you'd go to the website, which would give you your weekly tasks, and it would say do some reading maybe, and then it would say watch the lecture videos. The lecture videos were designed; they were about five to ten minutes each. They were they were supposed to be five, and sometimes they were a little bit longer. This class is about uh, looking at equations, looking at graphs, looking at empirical results, uh, understanding how finance works. And I found what, one of the challenges is how do you both talk and present visual material? And um, that's that's a challenge for how you how do you do that stuff? In my case, I. I primarily put things on the board because I have a very visual style and, and I don't like slides because slides, you lose track of what was on a previous slide. So the entire lecture is on the board and then we can point to things. Uh, you, the student, also can get a PDF of what the board looks like, looks like so you, you can see the whole thing in front of you. And we point to various equations and talk about them and then I'll put a table up in numbers and we'll talk about those and what they mean. Then there's a little in-video quiz to try to keep you awake. So you watch the video. Uh, then you go on and do the quizzes. There's a sort of weekly set of assignments. The first set of quizzes are multiple choice. The, the quizzes for now are, are basically multiple choice or numeric entry is really the only thing that works reliably. So you take some multiple choice quizzes about uh, the concepts we did. And then for my class, you go on to another set of uh, harder um, problem sets, which are, are, are like PhD problem sets. You to do some equation derivations, and then I check that you got the right answer by asking you to to fill in uh, to fill in numbers, the final equations. So you get stuck. What do you do? Uh, there's forums, and and I think as this thing develops, the social aspect is the part that really needs to develop a lot more. We we have that now in the forums. It's a discussion forum. The students talk to each other. Help. How do we do this quiz? How do we do that quiz? What was going on? Uh, I had TAs monitoring the forums, and they were very helpful. They, you know, especially with, if there was any typos or anything, they, they were in there quickly. Uh, I monitored the forums. It, it doesn't take a lot of time. Uh, you know, once a day I would check in and see how people were and chat back and forth on the forums. We also had uh, Google Hangouts, uh, where we would have sort of like office hours. Um, it worked best to have students email questions. My TAs would go through the questions, find some good ones, ask them, and then I would answer them in real time. Uh, obviously, Google Hangouts are a limited technology, and, and uh, that, that needs to be spiffed up, and, and I hope Coursera will put that in its own uh, technology as well. And that, that all develops that sense of community, which is where I think MOOCs really need to go. So that's, that's roughly the experience. How many people would come to those Hangouts? Uh, that's a good question. Um, now, Google Hangouts were limited to 10 active people, and we found that Google Hangouts, the, the voice in our direction didn't really work. Uh, so the answer is, in some sense, we don't know. Uh, we were getting emails from, I don't know, 20 to 25 people typically, and then we would post the Google Hangout onto YouTube so people could watch it either at the same time or, or uh, then they could watch it you know, whenever because they're in different time zones. So I'm not, I don't know how many people were actually watching the uh, Google Hangouts uh, YouTube thing. But the students uh, reported that they, they liked them a lot. It gave them an informal uh, time to talk. We talked about things other than the class, you know, how do I become an academic? Uh, when the Nobel Prizes came through, we talked about uh, all the uh, finance Nobel Prizes and gave them a chance to get to know me. So they, they said they liked that a lot. Yeah, that's nice. Um, now, you've written that the MOOC is the equivalent, uh, the modern equivalent of a textbook. What do you mean by that? <laughs> well, so there, there is the question, what, you know, what is the MOOC? Where will it go? Um, well, one, one note that we, we talk a lot about how it threatens college education. One thing I learned is that mostly MOOCs right now are adult education. There are people who are not going to college or interested in going to college, and, and mine too. It, you know, most people were not people who were – uh, you know, a, a threat to the university's business. Uh, but as far as textbook, um, you know, is this, people keep saying, is this going to displace us? No one will teach classes again. And, and my funny story is, 
1492, Gutenberg invented movable type. So textbooks will be presented. They'll just read the textbook. No one will come to our lectures. Well, that didn't work out. Um, although so it does, although it does, sense, it does in some classes. <laughs> I'm sorry well, to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I do think MOOCs – so now, finally enough funny stories. Uh, how will MOOCs function in the marketplace? One strong function already happening is that um, the, the MOOC class is something that a group of students at a university might take under the supervision of a faculty member. And then uh, the faculty member would use it for his own – his or her own flipped classroom – you know, you take a class at a university, your assignments are go do Cochrane's MOOC for week one, then come in and we'll talk some more and you'll take a final exam here. And so in that sense, functioning very much like a textbook. The, the, the same flipped classroom I used, somebody else could use uh, as well. Or if you, you know, if you feel like just reading a textbook, read a textbook. But I, I do think what we, the MOOC experience is not just a complete substitute for taking a class. It is also a set of tools uh, and uh, and materials that are the foundation for you know somebody else teaching a class, much much the same way a textbook is. Well, let's talk about the flipped part of your class, the live part that you did at the university. Uh, what kind of exp had you done that before? What was it like? Uh, what do you think the students got out of it that who compared to the students who didn't get the flipped part, who just did it online? Yeah, I thought that I thought it worked well. <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 hate, I hate to sound old, but young people today don't read. And uh, <laughs> if you give a reading assignment and you say, come in on Monday and discuss it, they look at you with blank faces. Uh, if you say, watch a set of five to seven minute videos, do some multiple choice tests, multiple choice quizzes. The quizzes also can refer to the reading assignments. By the way, I'm checking those quizzes and you're going to be graded on them and you got to get them in Sunday night at midnight. Lo and behold, the students come in Monday morning just very well prepared. They, they've they gotten the basic factual material that I present in a Me Talk You Listen lecture and, and ready to challenge me and really think about it. So um, now the flipped classroom is, is a lot harder for the faculty member. Um, it's really easy to just stand on the board and, and, and uh, I pretend to teach, you pretend to learn, and, and we uh, write equations down. Um, so, you know, running a discussion of some really uh, thoughtful PhD students, that, uh, that, that takes work, but it's, I think, much more satisfactory when you're done. So, bottom line, um, I think the students on cl in class got a better experience than the students on the MOOC. And also, you know, it, it freed me up in class to do more advanced material that the MOOCs, the MOOC students didn't get. Uh, but um, not everybody can spend four years of their life at the University of Chicago doing a PhD program. Uh, so I think the people who were taking the MOOC class got a really good uh, ha half of what the people in, in, on campus got. They, they get less of, so where does traditional teaching still last and where do MOOCs have to go? A lot of being a teacher is not knowing the right answer. It's knowing all the wrong answers. <laughs> And, and when you come in and say, uh, John, I, I really didn't get it because I thought that uh, when the expected return went up, we would make more money. I said, oh, no, no, no. That's mistake 32B slash 5. And You've heard I, it 7,700 <laughs> times in the last 10 years. Yeah, and even the ones that I haven't heard before, we can think through together. Now, that is the experience that is uh, much harder to replicate on a MOOC. The social part of MOOCs and the, and the forums make it – that that's where it goes, but really that's what distinguishes. That's going to be the challenge. Um, it's easy to put online. Um, how do you pass your pilot's license test? Um, material that's very cut and dried. I think it's somewhat easy to put online material where we all really know what the material is, and there's a well-studied pedagogy. You know, algebra 101. Uh, putting online things where. Um, the, the actual knowledge is closer to the research frontier and, and it's less well studied, that's, that's going to be harder. And getting that experience, you know, what teachers actually do of, of noticing your mistakes and helping you to correct them, uh, that's the social part of online that, that I think is, is it's there now, but I think that's what you still get in a good classroom. That's what's coming. Now, on the other hand, uh, you know, what's great about it, I'm, I'm snobby. Uh, I'm at the University of Chicago. If you're out in the middle of nowhere um, and, and your, you know, your faculty members aren't that good, well, I think the MOOC provides a great – it can provide a much better experience than a third-rate college education. Well, I think that's particularly true at the high school level. I think you know, people complain about 
a video class can't substitute for a great face-to-face teacher. No kidding. Uh, but most people don't have a great face-to-face teacher. I'll I'll keep my personal bias about the University of Chicago to myself. But uh, <laughs> we all would agree that there are teachers at every university, perhaps even at the University of Chicago, who are not so great in the classroom, That's not true. so great face-to-face. And the chance to learn from a great teacher uh, anywhere from anywhere in the world is a glorious thing. Let me ask you a tougher question. You think the people in the flipped classroom at in Hyde Park at Chicago got a better education than the people who just did the MOOC online. How would you compare the experience of the people who did the MOOC at Chicago with people who took the class from you with just the classroom three, four, five years ago without the MOOC technology, without the flipped part? And watched your uh, rear end as you watch as you put those equations <laughs> on the board, and let you know you could chat about uh, the Nobel laureates that that week if you wanted, or knew it. it. It's a different educational experience. Do you have any feel or uh, idea of what that new flipped classroom was like across those two choices? So I, th- I think it was uh, very good, and and um, you know even if one doesn't go MOOC, um, uh, using these online technologies. For regular classroom instruction, is is going to improve can improve classroom instruction a lot. Now, then, once you've created all the online materials, the marginal cost of opening it to a MOOC is zero. So that's part of where the economics may of this may go. Is is that uh, you know we're we're going to create these materials for in class use, and, and then it's free to open them up. But but um, I think it was very good. My students came more prepared. My students told me they liked it. Um, And so my lectures, my my five-minute MOOC lectures are very condensed. When you give a real lecture, you stop, you tell a joke, you let let things sink in. You try to get a sense of are people following, are they not? Half of them aren't, and they're just kind of hoping that they can go back and review it. And several students said, look, this is hard stuff. And I loved being able to stop it, rewind it, go back, um, you know, check something and not feel like I was the dummy who was holding up the class. Uh, so even just the flat lecture part, they said they got more out of they, – they liked me better online than in person. <laughs> and then, of course, it let us, it, it let us go into deeper um, discussions, um, more intuition, and more advanced material in class. I particularly – one reason I did this is that the modern business school, I think, can benefit greatly from online um, technology. We, we, um, business schools are gone pretty much to teaching three hours once a week. And it's a big strain on the human brain to, to get three hours of new material once a week. I, I find it hard to stay awake in an hour and a half seminar. Uh, and, um, you know, three hours once a week is a lot. Well, uh, and a lot of what we do now is, um, is six hours every two weeks or international programs that are, that are five concentrated days every six weeks. Uh, that's very hard in a traditional lecture and, and problem set um, uh, style. Now, think of that setup uh, with online materials where every day you watch a snippet of lecture, you do a little bit of a quiz, you get on the forum, you talk to your, your professor, your TAs, you talk about the intuition on the forum, and then you come together once a week to review what you've done. If you have a professor who can who can get a... Um, you know, a set of exercises or things we do together that really builds on those things. You have a much better learning experience. Yeah, I, I think that face-to-face part is um, – it's not – it's it's a, such a subtle thing. It's And it obviously varies tremendously by subject matter. I, one of my all-time favorite undergraduate classes was a class on Faulkner and Conrad. And we would read – I came into the class – Loving Conrad and not having much taste for Faulkner, but I figured I'd put up with the Faulkner and so I could enjoy the Conrad. By the end of the class, I loved Faulkner. I wasn't such a big Conrad fan anymore. And it wasn't because my teacher taught us a lecture that I could have watched on video or in face-to-face about how great Faulkner was. It was the conversation that took place in that classroom about – I think it was Professor Patterson, by the way. Thank you. Um, that conversation was – can't be if somebody watched it the film of that conversation they wouldn't get anything close to as much out of it as those of us who participate in it and i think that's what great learning is about and i think the ability of the web to deliver that is limited but positive and it depends on the on the material but we can't uh, be snobby not everybody can have a great professor like you did 
And so what I think the web, the online stuff certainly does is brings much better access to that sort of thing to people who are out of college or out in the middle of nowhere. And I also think this highlights, so I think the, the next step for MOOCs, MOOCs are now um, very much web 1.0. It's, it's one directional. It's, it's web pages. You're, you're looking through a web page, the beginnings of discussion forums. Uh, but, you know, we've, we've had discussion groups since the 1990s. Uh, I think the challenge and the opportunity for it is to move into web 2.0, where uh, that kind of social and discussion thing can happen um, remotely on a fairly large scale. And then I think you'll get, you'll get a lot better experience. It never will be as good as face-to-face -face with a great professor, um, but certainly it'll be face-to-face -face with your fellow students and, and some of that discussion thing. And we got to remember, uh, you know, Young people, uh, young people are very good at this. Uh, they they text each other across the rooms. My my kids text each other from different rooms of the same house, and seem to achieve a lot of core <laughs> communication that yeah, way. No, it's for sure. Um, <laughs> what do you think? Let's talk about the potential of MOOCs to disrupt either high school or college uh, or university education. Um, what do you think? Is it just a gimmick? Uh, do you think it's going to catch fire as, these, as the 2.0 version comes along? There's a lot of barriers to it, obviously, a lot of institutional barriers, certainly at the high school level. Um, and it requires a different set of skills. I think the skills it takes to be a great uh, flipped classroom teacher are not the same as the skills to be an enthralling lecturer to 500 people in a, in a, um, in a giant lecture hall. So wh where do you see that going? Well, for right now, MOOCs, their market is um, adult education primarily, sort of a group of people on Coursera especially who take lots of classes. Um, and uh, and I don't mean that disparagingly. A lot of – there's a whole group who takes finance classes together and, and helps – they, they showed up in my MOOC and helps each other out with the hard equations. Um, now, in uh, a, a classroom setting, the hard question for MOOCs is certification is when do you get college credit? When do you get something other than sort of, you know, your certificate from Coursera that you took this MOOC? When do employers start looking at MOOC certificates or groups of MOOC certificates as being a certification equivalent to um, undergraduate degrees? Uh, that's a harder question. Now that's starting to happen. Um, you know, universities, some universities are, are, they're sort of using the MOOC as textbook and then um, granting, you know, their their job is to say, here's 10 MOOCs that we think are worthwhile and we'll give you credit for taking these MOOCs, maybe with an exam that we proctor to see that you really know what you're doing. Um, so that's the, the, the step of disrupting uh, college and high school is intimately related with the step of when does taking a MOOC count for the kind of credit and credential that we give to people who take colleges and uh, and high school? That that's a hard step on both sides uh, for that everyone's thinking about. Seems to me a lot of it's cultural. I mean, I you know if, if I had um, to choose personally between or for my kids, and I have college age or near college age children, when I think about what advice I would give them about what to do with the next, say, four years of their life as they're about to go, go to college, it's um, it's hard to imagine saying, well, what you should do is you should stay home with, with us because it's cheap and, and you love us, of course, uh, and nothing you like more than living with us for another four years uh, as you enter young adulthood. You, you should live with us and, and every first six, four to six hours a day, uh, you should be online watching videos and doing the homework and doing the quizzes, and you'll save let, – let's say we've solved the certification problem. At the end of this year, you're going to fly to University of Chicago or wherever, and you're going to take the exams for these classes, and um, it'll cost a tiny, tiny fraction um, of, what it, of what it would cost otherwise. It's hard to make that leap, it seems to me. I know there's some people trying to create an all MOOC university. Uh, I don't know how that's going, but it's socially the social part of college is one is this, of course a whole separate question, uh, which is a huge I think part of what people pay for when they go to college. Um, 
But just on the education part, if you, if you want a technical degree, a degree in, say, a, a STEM field that, that lends itself to MOOC-style uh, precision, and um, it's an interesting option, I, It's hard, but it's hard to make that leap. It's going to culturally, I think. Well, cult- culture, you know, let's be economists for a minute. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the culture follows the economics. For the moment, if somebody says, comes to you and says, look, I, you know, I want to fix your computer and here's my 10 MOOC uh, that, that I took, does he really know what he's doing? And the certification part is, do they really know what they're doing? So a college oh, does. Oh, John, come on. You're, you're, John, you're going to tell me that just because they have a BA from University X that has a nice reputation, I know that I'm confident they know what they're doing. No, uh, I think that's a, but I think that's a lot of the functions of what universities do. Yeah. So we don't necessarily do a very good job of it, but um, you know that why do you hire somebody with a University of Chicago or Harvard degree? Well, you, that's a brand, and it's a brand that is um, pretty careful about its reputation. It it wants you to think that our students are good, and you can hire them with with confidence, and that we have certified that they know what they're doing, and you point out correctly that maybe we're not as good at uh, doing that as we say we are, and that, that we had better shape up, <laughs> and that that's the challenge uh, for MOOCs is to, um, especially if you want to start monetizing MOOCs and not making it for free, uh, to be able to say that you're providing that that branding, that, that reputational uh, service that colleges try to provide, and uh, some do and some don't. Well, let, let's talk about that monetizing, right? Because this technology in principle allows – and let's move away from economics. I'm going to go to math, which is I think um, – it's like economics in that there's a lot of really bad economics teachers I think teaching at the college and high school level. And I, know oh, that's, and I know that's true of math also. So let's take math. Uh, I can't – I apologize. I can't remember the professor's name uh, who I saw teaching a MOOC on calculus. But – I watched the first, I don't know, half an hour or so, and it was fabulous. Um, how many first half hours of calculus classes in America are fabulous? Well, there are a few. There's, there's, there's maybe 100, maybe there's 50, maybe, maybe there's even 300, but there aren't 40,000. And so when you think about all the high school students suffering through bad calculus teachers, that – the value of that half hour and, and the, the subsequent time – is so extraordinarily great. And now we've got a technology that delivers it. And I'd love for that professor to get fabulously wealthy. I'd love for that professor to become a millionaire, just like a great textbook writer could become wealthy. But this to me is more valuable than a great textbook. Uh, I'm not sure I could say why, but it just feels more valuable. It seems like it's more transformative uh, to, to do a great MOOC than to read a – because well, I guess the simple answer is textbooks generally aren't written, written to be read. They're written to be tasted. So here's somebody who can deliver hours of genuine insight into a very subtle and difficult area. That person should get fabulously wealthy uh, in in a market-based transformation of the education field. Can that happen? Um, Should, but let's let's go back just a minute and remember – you know, um, we've had the technology to play videotaped lectures for, you know, 20, 30 years, and, and that never really took off. So it's, it's the, a successful MOOC is more than just great lectures. Uh, however, I agree with you totally, especially having suffered through lots of bad math classes myself, and, and that math is not cut and dried. It's about intuition. It's about passion. And, uh, and even perhaps your, you know, your bad high school math teacher might be able to sit in the, cl- in the flipped classroom and help students through problems uh, that, uh, that they encounter after having done the, the great MOOC. But yes, yeah, so ec- the economics of it, um, uh, a, a large base can, you know, you can reap a lot of, put a lot of pennies together and get, uh, uh, and get a superstar economy. That's one of the, oh, one of the monetizing uh, ideas is that this will make um, teaching like so many other things where a few super superstars earn a lot of money and other people are there at best to be glorified TAs and uh, won't, won't make a lot of money. That's a possibility. Uh, the, uh, the flip side uh, is that this is a zero footnote, marginal cost business. It's hard to charge money for a zero marginal cost business. That's correct. But the certification is where I think the, the monetization comes in to the extent that you could um, – if people could verify that you got an A in a very hard class, a genuinely hard class. In fact, 
the certification could be better with a MOOC because you could actually be transparent about what an A meant. Whereas at many, many universities now, an A is much uh, less valuable than it used to be. And as a result, breathing. what? Yeah. It means you showed up to the final exam and yeah. you can breathe. Yeah. Shame on, shame on, I don't know who, that's the problem. It's an emergent phenomenon, this phenomenon of great inflation. And uh, uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. But if, if you said, here's what you had to do to get an A in this class, it actually could have a, a lot more value. And you wouldn't care if, if 80% of the people got an A because you'd know what it meant. Uh, you'd know in a way you can't know about a calculus class at a university level. So I don't know. I think, I think the potential to do that is very large, and I'm not sure what's holding it back. Certainly at the um, – I think both at the university and the high school level, right? The high school level has an immense amount of – of material available, say, at Khan Academy and elsewhere at the level that high school students can really teach themselves a great deal of material. The areas where it's weak, obviously, are writing uh, and what we might call thinking. But I don't think a lot of thinking gets taught in most high school classes anyway. So um, maybe I'm wrong, but what do you think? Well, I think I think you're exactly right. I mean, so let, let's – there's this danger in discussing things like education and health care too. Uh, you know, to, to say everybody has to have the absolute best. But um, if the majority of high school students could come out knowing calculus, uh, you know, knowing basic grammar, uh, getting sentences out, uh, and, and how to program a computer, uh, even without the deep appreciation of literature that it would be lovely if they had, that would be a you know, huge step forward in our, in, <laughs> in our world. Seems that way. Uh, but what you just said is, is interesting about the economics. It, you know, you said that essentially there's, there's a function is the branding one. And that is, you know, so there's a hundred calculus MOOCs, which are the good ones. And, um, you know, maybe the economic rent will come to the person who says, look, I've studied all of these and here's the five good ones. Uh, I give you the, uh, the Russ Roberts degree, uh, because you've taken this list of MOOCs as opposed to the actual, you know, well, then they could split with the professor himself. The other, the other model is, uh, you know, our universities uh, do a tremendous amount for brand name recogni recognition. And once something is zero marginal cost, um, we may end up just giving it away for free because everybody wants to be the big brand name of uh, the global university. We'll see how that works out. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. What, what, I, what I'm waiting for, and, and I don't know if I'll wait in vain, is for John Cochran and 25 other, maybe 40 other fabulous uh, business professors around the world to offer an MBA that uh, is disembodied. It's not in a physical location except maybe for the exam, and maybe we could solve that problem as well. Um, and that, ex that, that would be a very, uh, you know, ironically, it would be an inexpensive degree to acquire, but very lucrative for the faculty who were uh, involved. And of course, it's a different experience than being the faculty member at a normal university. You don't have the collegiality and stimulus of the research side. But it's an interesting model that, you know, some people are, they're, we're limping toward that model. I don't see anybody sprinting toward it. Well, except, so what does a, a, a bricks and mortar business school do that that doesn't do? A bricks and mortar business school um, is selective about who they let in. In fact, we're often accused of, of simply being really good at selecting smart people and then giving them a two-year party. Uh, we have uh, connections to employers. We have a fantastic um, uh, office that gets them jobs, and we have an alumni network. Now, I think you know you can form an alumni network. Um, you know, the, the people who met online in my class still stay in touch with each other, which I think is a inter very interesting uh, phenomenon. And I wonder in your model whether you could be picky and say, look, before you're allowed to take this class or be be part of our MBA, you have to score so much on the GMAT or something of the sort to to, to do this election part as well. But I think it's a very interesting model. Uh, maybe I should get off my butt and do it. And, and the high school model is even, I think, even more disruptive because, I, uh, you know, as we can joke about Modern university education has has many problems, but I don't think it has as many as the modern high school uh, high school and the opportunity to homeschool. Enough people don't like their high schools for a variety of reasons, but enough people don't like them that they homeschool their kids to have a way to. And this is already happening, of course. People are using these online uh, uh, resources with great uh, zeal. But the opportunity to put together an entire high school experience via an online education uh, is uh, – and which, by the way, a lot so much time in high school is wasted 
So you could spend your mornings in class and you could spend your afternoons at museums or building, uh, you know, whatever you wanted in your garage or coding or doing a thousand, becoming learning the flute. You, there's a thousand things you could do more effectively than sit 30 people in a room uh, and, uh, event during adolescence and hope they behave themselves. It just seems to me that the opportunity to transform high school education is huge. Absolutely. And there you've also made a transition. Um, uh, high school education is a material that is by and large codified, even, even where in some cases it's codified wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it is by and large codified. We do not ask high school teachers to be, to be researchers to think, to think new, new things. We ask them to be professional pedagogues and, and to know how to get a, a codified set of material in. And, and they are certainly the economies of scale. And one of the great things MOOCs are doing is learning about pedagogy. Um, we, as universities, we are we're pretty uh, bad at actually self using our. We're supposed to be empirical social scientists, but we don't really look at how we do that well. And the, the MOOCs are looking at what works and what doesn't work in the way way of all tech. When you get to university, the the idea of the research university is that you're at a level where the textbooks are a little bit out of date. And so you get together with a professor and kind of think through things that are still at the fuzzy edge. That's going to be harder to bring to MOOCs, but, but frankly, so little of, of what, you know, we actually have to teach people is at that level. Even introductory university classes are, are often pretty cut and dried as well. Uh, so I agree. And that, that could be a, a great savior of the American high school experience. Now you say, we'll miss the social side. I'm, I'm not sure that the majority of people feature. think the social <laughs> side of high school is a great thing. Yeah, it's a feature, not a bug. Um, <laughs> Let me ask you a question that that uh, comes from Arnold Kling, who's been on here to talk about these issues as well. And I have a couple insights for him I want to hear your reaction to. One is that education is feedback. So what Arnold, I think, means by that is that the way you learn, think about this is, you know, we call it, we call feedback, oh, yeah, I gave him a quiz or I gave him a homework set. But what, what he's really talking about is a wide range of subtle things, which is when the – does the student know whether – the students catching on. And I think so much when I think of my failings as a teacher, it's when I just sort of said, well, it's up to them. They've got to figure it out. And I don't, I'm not going to give them, uh, I loved and, and still do open-ended questions that don't have precise answers. And my students would say, well, but I don't know, how am I doing? And I'd say, don't worry, you're learning. That's, that's what this is about. This isn't about, I got a 73 and I need to study more. Or I got a 96 so I can slack off. This is an intellectual adventure. Well, most students don't like intellectual adventures for, for some reasons they don't like are not so good, but some are, are good, which is they don't really know what they know. And so I think the biggest challenge of the MOOC is, is that. How do you give feedback? How do you help students understand what they know and don't know to lead to mastery? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the two parts of education are the social structure that keeps you going and the feedback um, in, with a great teacher, uh, the, the person who, uh, as we talked about before, who knows all the wrong answers and can help you quickly straighten out a misconception, uh, quickly see where you're kind of thinking about things wrong and bring you back to the correct path, let you see how you're doing relative to some standard of mastery. Um, now, you know, they have their quizzes. Um, and that's uh, I, on the good part of it, actually. Um, Formalized quizzing uh, does is in some sense better than write an essay and I'll have a graduate student grade the essay to see if you know what you're doing. We're not that great at feedback in the traditional university. And so the marginal, the old marginal cost thing, you know, once I write a good multiple choice quiz, 100,000 people can take it and get some sense of, of where they are. Uh, the quizzing I found was one of the weakest points of, of current software that, that I used and, and clearly one that can be improved dramatically. And um, maybe students will get they'll, – they'll certainly get better assessment um, than, than they often do now. The challenge is to get that feedback to help them get out of um, sort of bad, bad ruts. And there, there I think the, the Web 2.0 social development is going to be key to making it work better. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. But I, what I think is is bizarre about the modern university is that so many professors give multiple choice exams out of I have to what I have to assume is laziness. Um, I've done I've given a few in my time, but most of my exams were open ended 
challenging questions that didn't have easy, straightforward answers. In fact, they were so not straightforward, I often would grade them myself rather than using my teaching assistants. And that was very time intensive. And I think that was when I was the, the best teacher that I was, when I the more open-ended and challenging those questions were. As, you know, the funny part is, you, you, when you're teaching 100,000 students, you can't grade them individually. You can't grade, you can't go through them. You want to exploit the kind of music you're talking about. But I think, unfortunately, at many modern universities, 200 or even 80 is too many for people to grade thoughtfully. So they just use multiple choices. If they're teaching, a, they're, they're going to exploit the economies of scale, even though they're in a, supposedly in a small class. Yeah. And I think that's a, just a terrible tragedy. Well, what, what, what you're saying is that what the MOOC really endangers is the 150-person lecture class at a second-rate uh, university. Because that, that we know, that the MOOC can do with a multiple choice quizzing and no real feedback and a graduate student who barely speaks English as your TA, uh, that, that the MOOC can do a lot better. Um, the, the 20 person class where you get great feedback from a great professor, yeah, that'll still be there, but that's like saying, you know, uh, uh, Southwest Airlines isn't as good as a private jet. Yeah, well, thanks. <laughs> right. But it is true. Um, so one of my biggest frustrations with the with the current state of MOOCs in in doing my quizzes and assessments is that like you, um, I, I organize my classes around weekly problem sets and they were almost all open ended and particularly a puzzle type. Hey, mm -hmm. yeah. here, here's here's a natural misconception. Uh, how do you resolve this question? And you got to go resolve this question. I, now you can't ask. I couldn't figure out how to ask that in machine gradable form. Or, uh, you know, here, here's a theorem, prove it. You can't ask that in machine gradable form. Um, and when you so, do, when you do, you take away the learning, right? You take away the experience the student has. If you say, here's four answers, one of them's the right one, three are awful, the student can often say, oh, yeah, well, it's a, I know what he wants. He wants A because B, C, and D are that's He never talks about those things. But you don't learn anything from that. You don't learn anything the way you do when you have to get up in front of your right. study mates and defend an answer to a puzzle that you think is right and they think is awful. Now, on the horizon, I think they can do a little better. Um, so you certainly can do uh, ask a question, write a paragraph, and you can think of ways of grading a paragraph um, that can mechanically grade things. So I, you know, I, I often do this. My actual grading, I hate to tell this, my students might be listening. You know, I'll, I'll ask, uh, here's a puzzle. The expected return on one strategy looks better than another. How do you solve this? And the way I grade it is if the word beta appears in the answer, they get credit. Oh, <laughs> they don't. John, so I'll, could, I'll edit this out. That. I'll edit this out. <laughs> yeah, the equivalent, the equivalent for me is, uh, so here, here's, here's, here's a puzzle that I, I thought of for my kids. This is what I call dinner table economics. So the puzzle is uh, why do light bulbs last longer than they used to? Because a lot of people think light bulbs, oh, that's they wear out because they want to sell you more light bulbs. That's a really bad answer. So if that was one of the answers, again, if you wrote that down as one of the answers compared to, say, the correct answer, which I'm not going to say, uh, it's not a hard question, but it's, it, you should think about it out there. The, the right answer is you got to think about, but there is a key word in that right answer. And if I saw it, I, yeah, I could grade it pretty quickly. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, I've gotten pretty good at multiple choice uh, questions. So, <laughs> well done, multiple choice ones. Yeah, they can, can be done well. Think. That's true. But the machine, you know, how do you machine grade assessments? Is that's one of the big challenges. Yeah, I'm not sure it's ever going to be uh, a fully uh, fully solved, but maybe it'll just be solved pretty well, and that'll that'll be good enough. I want to give you another ch different kind of challenge. Uh, let's take me. I'm your student. Uh, I'm your only student. You know, there's a famous – I think I've talked about this on Econ Talk before. I think it was uh, – I think Pagu – tell me if you know this story. I think Pagu took a class for Marshall where Marshall came to teach the class and Pagu was the only student. I may not have the names right, but there's a famous British economist who showed up every day or every couple times a week. And he had one student and he taught the class as if there were 80 students there. Uh, and he just lectured, and the student, if it was Pagu, it took notes, and that was the class. Um, now, Arnold Kling, again, asked the, raised the following question. He says, I think that the best way to think about teaching is to think about what would you do if you had just one student in the room rather than think about, wow, I could get 100,000 students to watch this lecture. So let's take me. I'm your student, John. I know a little bit about finance, not very much. I'm okay at math. I'm not a star. I can do some of the math, but some of the math in your class was challenging for me. I'd have to tool up. 
I show up at your door and I want you to create a class for me. Now, of course, the ideal isn't you don't have time to create a class for me. So I want you really to create an online class, but it's for people like me. Is that different than what you do for 100,000 people? That's my question. Um, yes. So to, to answer that question, one thing which, which implicitly you bring up is that um, MOOCs may allow a lot more customization. Um, you can do MOOCs on, on subjects. So in the modern university, you cannot teach a one-person class. Sorry, you know, yeah. we, we watch the bottom line. Um, but if there's, uh, you know, if, if you're interested in yeah, early teach, 13th we century can teach poetry. Three. We can teach three people sometimes, though. So, so you're, <laughs> not, you're, make, you're making it sound school. like. <laughs> but if, you know, if you want to teach a class in, uh, in, in uh, early 13th century Iranian poetry or something of the sort, there, there are 150 people around the world who might be interested in that. And so we, one thing this might do is to give us classes that are both more specialized in topic and more specialized to the person. Yeah. Um, there could be, there, there are already, you know, a hundred introduction to finance classes and, and uh, there, there's one out there that is exactly right for your interest and your level. So to some extent, the MOOC is, is going to do that. The thing it's not going to do, which I would do with you if, if we're one-on-one, -on -one, is, of course, I would not give a lecture. We, we would talk, and it would be a lot more of me listening, which is um, – so I, in, in my other instruction life, I'm a flight instructor, which, which is done one-on-one, -on -one, and where assessing the student's competence is really important, and where assessing the student's misconceptions about how things work is, is really important. And uh, that is, that's what you do when you're one-on-one -on -one and the guy needs to learn to fly the plane. And, and uh, by one-on-one -on -one sort of quizzing, uh, I'll pose a puzzle, you tell me the answer, I'll go, is that really how it works? Uh, we really explore what you understand and what you misunderstand. That's the way you teach one-on-one -on -one classes, and that's a thing that's hard to do on a MOOC. Um, would you really trust a pilot of your plane right. who said, I learned to fly on a MOOC and a simulator. Yeah. He might be darn good. And uh, he would certainly have run through all sorts of accident scenarios that the MOOC and the simulator did. But, but there might be a few remaining misconceptions about uh, things that, that had gotten through the, the grapevine, uh, that, that had gotten through the process that you might worry about. But to think about me again, and I think your point about specialization and customization is exactly right. And, it, you know, I don't – I think we've just scratched the surface on this. Right now, the way it's customized is, oh, yeah, I know this material. I'll just fast forward through it or I don't know it. I'll play it three or four times and that's great. But obviously, there's going to be a way where you can say, I want to go down this path or that path. Uh, and there's going to be menus and options that aren't available right now. And, uh, you know, one way to think about this is, you know, you have – the high school student who's a superstar and is being held back, you give them extra extra problems, you give them extra reading and so on. And I think the MOOC has the potential to do that with you know extraordinary uh, success. But I'm thinking about just the pedagogy for a minute. Like you said, you wouldn't lecture to me, right? So what would you have me do? You'd have – would you have me read? Would you have me watch the videos and then we'd talk? Would you probe and quiz and challenge me to see what I knew? What would be the pedagogical differences between that one-person class and a bigger class? Uh, yeah, well, um, we, if I had all these materials, I actually would have you watch videos for just straight explanation stuff rather than me give a personalized lecture one-on-one. -on -one. I, I would save my time. I mean yep. we're also presuming my time. I, I hope your example wasn't one where we presume my time is completely worthless. Right. You're just at <laughs> as, my beck and call, my, John, for all my dumb questions. That's what it is. <laughs> As with my, you know, my flight instruction students, uh, I, I say, look, I am not going to give you one-on-one -on -one lecture. You're going to read the book, and you're going to come back and we're talking about the book. And and so I would have you. I think you know the MOOC materials would be great. But then we would spend a lot of time one-on-one, -on -one, you know, probing what you know and what you don't know, and helping straighten things out and working on problems together. Uh, you know, that would be the ideal thing to do in the one-on-one. -on -one. But you know, not everyone can have that. I think. Um, you know, the, the economics you set out exactly. How do we leverage the talents of the best possible ones to give something that's pretty gar darn good to 100,000 people and maybe more tailored to what they know than even, you know, being in a class with one great professor and 25 other dumb students isn't that great either. Well, my, my hope is that I, I want the technology to leverage something you referred to in passing, which I think is underrated, which is the wrong answers. 
Um, I've always dreamed about a problem set based class, which could be delivered to lots of people because I've done it so many times. I know all the wrong answers. I know the likely mistakes you're going to make. So when you make those, I don't just say wrong and you get to guess again. I say wrong. Here's a hint. And you get to go back into the into the tree and figure out which branch you should have gone down. Or I, I think that's the um, the gold. That's the standard that that we could maybe hit someday. Now that is, you know, that is something in principle MOOCs should be able to do. The the quizzing should be able to, uh, you know, when you have uh, questions in a field that's that's well enough developed that you kind of know the wrong answers, um, a good quiz should pose something. There's a there's a there's a wrong answer, and even you know, enter an equation. It's the wrong equation. Oops, I recognize what you're doing wrong. Help you find it and so forth. Um, right now, at, at least the Coursera software that I used is, is quite primitive relative to that. I, I wasn't even able to allow students to attempt a question, get the wrong answer, and then get a hint and try that question again. Um, this is simple programming, um, but I, I certainly think that, that flexible quizzing that responds to common wrong answers is something that, that certainly should be and probably will be in the, you know, the version 2.0 of the software. So let's close. I want to talk about about econ talk, this uh, particular form of online education. And I've thought about teaching a MOOC or creating a MOOC, and I realize I've got this wonderful, massive, open online educational experience already. Uh, which is that those of you out there are listening, many of you, tens of thousands, are listening every week, uh, and over the course of of a year or two years, it's it's closer to a hundred thousand for a particular episode. That's that's interesting to people, and I think we could do much better than that. And I think there's a lot of you out there who'd like to engage more than just listening for an hour a week. So first, I want to say that I'm working on those now. I'm trying to find some ways to leverage my time effectively that I can interact with you and provide material for you as we start to do this year already a little bit with this essay contest. I need a better way to communicate with you other than Twitter and Facebook because many of you aren't on those uh, those sites. And the only way you hear me is this once a week for an hour, which is by definition uh, delayed the way we do it, which I think is fine. But I'm I'm working on that. And I'm curious, John, if you have any thoughts on that, what could I do? So my first thing is those of you out there, please, uh, if you are interested in going deeper into some of these ideas and looking for connections between one episode and another, I'm going to try to start creating those um, resources for you. But I'm curious, John, having taught a MOOC, if you have any thoughts on what we could do to make econ talk a little more valuable to the audience. Yeah, let me um, let me preface by celebrating the question. Um, you're a real uh, out the box thinker on how do we get economic ideas and economic discussion into a larger framework. There's there's MOOCs are part of it. They're one technological format. Blogs are another. Um, uh, econ talk is is it is is uh, obviously another way of getting these ideas out. And boy, it's just ex it's an exciting question to start thinking about. Now, what can we do? Um, Sometimes talking, um, you know, it goes on too long. I, my daughter listens to you faithfully, and but listens while she runs or reads or, or I'm sorry, runs or paints or does something else, uh, because then then she says when it gets boring, she <laughs> just kind of zone out yeah, for a sure. while. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, obviously, integrating visual <laughs> would be an interesting thing to do. Um, some sort of back and forth. Uh, we don't want to turn it into talk radio. Um, that would be interesting. Um, some sort of something on the range of TED Talks, um, you know, ask me to do a little more homework and, and prepare something to show uh, for show for 10 minutes and then discuss it. That might be an interesting to do, you know, get get into those sort of deeper economic ideas. Um, uh, that, that would be an interesting thing to do. Uh, this, uh, this is a great question with 100 different answers, and, and I hope you keep exploring it. Yeah, well, one thing that's I'm what I say to all my students. So yeah. That's my standard classroom <laughs> answer to all my students when they say something. I don't know what the answer is. Great question. <laughs> yeah, well, that's OK. Uh, I think we'll, we'll head toward, an, toward a bunch of answers. I don't think, you know, there obviously isn't one answer. And I think one of the great advantages of, of audio is uh, the opportunity to zone out, by the way, or to re-listen to it. I know a lot of you out there listen to these more than once, which uh, I, I stand in awe of that uh, of that fact, it's, it boggles my mind. Um, but what I'm thinking of is is some way to test or 
quiz or challenge people to take what they've heard and take it a little uh, a little further. And I think uh, that I think is what would make this experience for some subset. Obviously, there are many of you out there who aren't interested in that. Uh, you, you're happy an hour a week's maybe more than enough. But for those of you who want to go deeper and want to learn more, I think uh, we're going to look for some ways to do that. Well, certainly, if one wants to use EconTalk as materials in a classroom setting, which I know people do, or as a material for a MOOC, uh, the feedback I've gotten from MOOCs that the occasional quizzes, the, the little quizzes every couple minutes in the lectures and the quizzes afterwards, you know, you know, what was the main point? Uh, how would you disagree with Cochrane's statement about X, Y, and Z? Those things kept people awake, engaged, made them go back and, and review things and, and put things in a framework and, and solidify it as a learning experience. When, when there is something that is a learning experience, adding that part of the MOOC technology could be, uh, could be quite useful. My guest today has been John Cochran. John, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. It's been a pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.